मीनाक्ष मैम वी आर लाइव थैंक यू थैंक यू if anyone feel the need to turn up the tv volume so loud that others complain or often ask people to repeat what they are saying have trouble hearing over the telephone or fails to hear it ring or they find it hard to follow conversation when two or more people are talking and they think that others are often mumbling and they are using louder volume to speak any of these could mean that they might have hearing loss and they should get their hearing hearing checked at the earliest by a qualified audiologist timely help can minimize the devastating effects of hearing loss good evening i am minakshi badhera an audiologist and speech language pathologist and on behalf of Indian Speech and Hearing Association I welcome you again to another enlightening session of speech and hearing awareness annuals 2020 through these annuals our main purpose is to inform people what are various kinds of speech language or hearing problems what they can do about it and whom they should contact to get the best possible intervention help before but before we start today's session of this series i would like to invite dr arun bane who is a past president of isha to address us all dr bane good evening to all i am very happy that indian speech language and hearing association has been involved in creating awareness and organizing the speech and hearing weeks annuals 2020 began from 1st december onwards in the last few days we have noticed that a tremendous efforts has been made by our all fellow fellow professional senior members life members all the different chapters and branches in india for organizing such an mega events also we are happy that many professionals as well as others students invitees are participating in the series of these webinars today also we are having very important yet another session in the annuals which highlight the real areas in speech and hearing and the vast field that we work in understanding the role of audiologist in tinnitus and vertigo there are sequels of hearing loss and these things a lot of issue to an individual life is come across if you think about the all the research findings research areas even today there are roughly 10 to 15% of the populations are also having the sequels of hearing loss having associated with tinnitus and vertigo in order to it is important for every one of us including the common population to understand the role of audiologist in assessment and management of tinnitus and vertigo it is a it is a very important area and this area need to be explored that we we must learn much about these gray areas of tinnitus and vertigo that which need to be a commonly a routine practice among the professional of audiologists and speech language pathologists in the country and in all over today we have very important panelist very important scientist in the area who are participating as a resource persons 
and giving their sharing their knowledge and what i gone tinnitus and how audiologist can help i am sure that this information will give us benefiting us to every one of us including the professional even the students even the, all the students who are who are now studying in the area of audiology and speech language pathology i am sure that this continuous efforts been taken by the isha during this uh, speech and hearing weeks will definitely help and grow our profession as well as to strengthen our our association as well i am happy that all of you have joined and please join us and share your thoughts everyone thoughts and let us work together for the developments in the field where our enlight is always required i am very thankful that once again on behalf of the president and the executive members council members of indian speech language and hearing associations for welcome you all including the important eminent scientist for today's resource person i once again welcome and please join us for this webinar thank you thank you giving me an opportunity to give an welcome at this thank you thank you sir as sir said today we have a very important session think about how easily most of you are able to stand erect bend over and resume the previous position without falling walk turn and run without stumbling and be able to perform various activities every day without without tumbling or being hurt this is because you are blessed with the sense of body balance but for many these small movements could cause spinning or what we call vertigo to know why this happens and what we can do about it let's hear to what our team of very experienced professionals have to say regarding this in our today's session but before we go join them we had very interesting session yesterday on swallowing and uh, if you missed it you can still watch it on our U isha uh, channel youtube channel called isha annuals and tomorrow log in to uh, another interesting session on autism so this session today is being moderated by a very young and bright um, you know research researcher teacher dr sujit kumar sina he is a associate professor in audiology at aish mysore and has 11 years of teaching and he has a numerous publications and numerous papers that is presented in various national and international conferences and is a guide and uh, and masters uh, of 25 master dis, uh, dissertations over to you dr sujit sina uh good evening everyone at the outset i would like to thank uh, the indian speech and hearing association uh, for providing me this opportunity uh today uh, we have an important topic that is uh, a panel discussion on vertigo and we also have a talk on uh, uh, tinnitus by dr vinay manchaya now before i go ahead uh, with the uh, sessions actually i would uh, first like to introduce my panelist over here the first panelist is mr uh, suresh t he is a clinical audiologist and a speech language pathologist presently he is working as a research coordinator for dr src bangalore research center and he is also an associate professor at dr uh, src is bangalore he is an alumni of ais mysore he is uh, working uh, he has over 29 years of working experience and also he has worked in uae for more than 13 years and presently he works in the area of cochlear implant vertigo assessment and management aphasia management and child language disorder on behalf of uh, indian speech language and hearing association i welcome you sir for this panel thank you sir our uh, next panelist is dr vinay m uh, when i looked into dr vinay's uh, uh, cv actually uh, if i start reading his cv 
uh, it will take uh, another two hours for me to finish his CV, his credentials. Uh, he is uh, he was uh, my immediate junior at Ice Mysuru, but looking at his credentials, it is just like you know, it's just wonderful. Okay, I'll take another two hours probably to read his uh, this one, but I have just uh, taken out a few important things from there. And uh, Dr. Vinay is Professor of Speech and Hearing Sciences at Department of Speech and Hearing Sciences, Lamar University, USA. Uh, he has received various prestigious awards. Out of that, uh, important ones are Innovation Award for Research at the Lamar University, a Riskin Fellow at the University of Canterbury, Christchurch, New Zealand, Mary and Jack Sapiro Prize awarded by the British Tinnitus Association. In three consecutive years, he has received the award 2017, 18, and 19. He has also received Bharat Samman Award by the non resident Indian Institute, known as NRI Institute, Delhi, in uh, 2017. And he was also felicitated as Jerger Future Leaders of Audiology by the American Academy of Audiology in the year 2016. He has almost close to 200 international publications. He has authored several books and contributed chapters in many books. On behalf of Indian Speech, Language and Hearing Association, I welcome you to this panel, Dr. Vinay. Dr. Neeraj Kumar Singh. He has uh, completed his graduation, post-graduation, and PhD at uh, Ice Mysuru. And uh, presently, he is working as a reader in audiology at Department of Audiology, Aish. And uh, let me just tell you that he is one of the pioneers in the field of vestibular assessment and management. And uh, if you look at his number of publications related to vestibular in international journal, it just crosses more than half centuries. And uh, he is also a recipient of several best paper awards at various conferences. And he is also certified uh, audiologist in vestibular assessment and management. I welcome you to this panel, Dr. Neeraj. Our next panelist is Dr. You, Kaus Dr. Kauslindra Kumar. Dr. Kausal is working as associate professor at Department of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology, Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore. He has uh, 14 years of teaching experiences and uh, primarily he works in the area of vestibular assessment. And uh, let me admit it that um, it was um, uh, Dr. Kausal who has started recording uh, WEMP actually in India. It was way back in 2006 when he was doing his uh, master's at ICE and he recorded WEMP for the first time at ICE as a part of his dissertation. And he has uh, uh, several national and international publications and also he is a recipient of several best paper awards at various national and international conferences. I welcome you to this panel, Dr. Kausal. Mr. Vignesh. Mr. Vignesh is presently working as Faculty Institute of Speech and Hearing, Madras Medical College and Rajiv Gandhi Government General Hospital, Chennai. He, is also, he has also completed graduation and post-graduation from Ice Mysuru. And presently, he is pursuing his PhD at Ice Mysuru. And he is also a gold medalist of his class. And he has several research publications in national and international journal. And presently, his thesis for his thesis, he is working in the area of vestibular assessment. I welcome you to this panel, Mr. Vignesh. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sarup Bikas Misra. Uh, Mr. Sarup has completed his master's in audiology and speech language pathology from Bharti Vidya Peet, Pune. He has received training in assessment and management of vestibular disorder at USA. And he is the first certified vertigo specialist and independent clinic on vertigo in Odisha. At present, he is working as visiting consultant for hearing, vertigo, and speech related issues in corporate hospitals in Bhuvaneswar, Odisha. He is also the director and founder of Sresta Hearing, Vataigo and Speech Care, Bhuvaneswar and Katak. He has uh, over nine years of experience and he has written uh, chapters in many prestigious books and also he has delivered talk in many national and international conferences. I welcome you to this panel, Mr. Swaroop. Thank you, sir. Uh, before I go ahead with the... Uh, Final uh, discussion. Uh, I will uh, just uh, uh, present a small uh, topic on uh, what I go, and uh, then we can go ahead with the panel discussion on what I go. Is my screen visible? 
yes yes okay um uh, it's a very small presentation very short presentation it is on vitigo things you need to understand uh, about vitigo now uh, we would have experienced many patients coming to our clinics or hospitals where we are working with a complaint of giddiness dizziness turning uncertainty blackout falling chakkar and steady they have their own way of defining the problem who will come with a, a report of uh, vitigo or a report of giddiness or dizziness to our clinic now as an audiologist what we do generally what we do is when we are not working in the area of vestibular assessment and management generally we happen to record an abr and we look for one to five latency and also we look for interoral latency differences of wave five for the abr and if we find no differences we say that okay you have no problems please go to another professionals same thing happens uh, with other professional also if the vitigo patient does not fall in their domain they send them to other professionals and trust me that uh, here in the screen there is a patient of vestibular uh, disorder and that patient is here that is the football here the patient of any vestibular disorder becomes a football between the different professionals okay i don't want to name the professionals but he the patient literally becomes a football between the different professionals now before we go ahead with what is vertigo let us understand what is balance now what happens is that maintenance of balance uh, 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 it's maintained by three systems basically that is our visual system the proprioceptive system and our and our uh, vestibular system the visual system is basically responsible for maintenance of image and the proprioceptive system basically is important to understand the platform on which we are standing we are uh, moving we are running we are jumping so whether the platform is mobile platform whether it is a hard surface whether it is a soft surface that information is conveyed by our proprioceptive system and third one is vestibular system which is very important it balances our body during the head movement now what happens is that we make any movement the information from this three system is sent to the central nervous system the central nervous system is going to combine the information from the three sensory system and then it is going to generate an output to the required muscles limbs uh, joint or the neck muscles to the vestibulospinal system and this is how we are able to balance now there is another important structure which helps us in balancing that is our cerebellar system and cerebellar system is very important in any fine motor coordination so if a person reports to you with a problem of a uh, vertigo imbalance giddiness or dizziness whatever the issue is it could be because of a problem in the visual system it could be a problem in the proprioceptive system it could be because of a problem in the vestibular system or the pathways between the vestibular system to the central nervous system the central nervous system itself may be a uh, uh, there may be a damage to the central nervous system there may be a problem in the efferent motor system or there may be problem at the muscles or the limbs or the joints which is there and also there could be a problem of cerebellar system when the person reports of imbalance issues also there are some patients who will report to you saying that they are not comfortable in the crowd when they go to crowd crowded place when there is a crowded place what happens is they faint down or when they are there in an open space what happens is because of the fear they faint down and this is purely a psychological condition which is called as agoraphobia that means to say that for vertigo or for for imbalance issues there is a structural problem there is a functional problem also there is a psychological problem which is there so the first message which we have to take home that all that glitters is not gold and all that imbalances or the patient who come with imbalance issues are not of vestibular origin they could be there could be something else also now we have to understand the vestibular system now what happens is that generally when a patient reports with a complaint of vertigo now everyone tries to find out a bakra that is the scapegoat that now whom to held responsible for this vertigo and 99% of the time it is the inner ear which is which is blamed for all these imbalance issues in the patient now once you understand that uh, uh, the person has got imbalance issues because of uh, the inner ear you need to be prepared for certain assessment tool you need to enter inside the ear of the person and once you enter inside the person's ear you have got uh, middle ear and you have got the inner ear now inner ear basically you have as we understand that we have the cochlear portion and we have the vestibular portion and the vestibular portion consists of the three semicircular canal and the saccule and the utricle 
Now, this uh, picture is something which is very favorite of mine and uh, these are usually present. Uh, now, here what happens is certain connections which we have to understand here from the vestibular system. Now, when we look at the auditory system, what happens is that in the auditory system, we have certain designated nuclei that is from the cochlea, the signal will go to the cochlear nucleus, to SOC, to LL, to IC, to MGB, to auditory cortex. That's it. It doesn't go anywhere else. Whereas when we look into the vestibular system, the signal goes at many places. And that is where the person or the patient, when they report of vertigo or imbalance issues, it could be, of, it could be because of many uh, other problems also. Now here, uh, the vestibular nerves, which are connected to the peripheral structure of uh, which is uh, connected uh, to the vestibular nuclei, the vestibular nerve. And from the vestibular nuclei, there is a connection which is to supply to the first one is the medullary vomiting center, and uh, which is responsible for basically inducing vomiting sensation in any of the human being. Now, the second connection which is important is from the vestibular nuclei, there is a connection through the thalamus area. It is going to the central nervous system. Another connection which is supplied to the a spinal cord which is called as vestibular spinal reflex pathway and in turn it is supplied to your limbs and another important connection from the vestibular nuclei to the um, uh, is to the cerebellar system and from the cerebellar system again you have another connection which is coming to your vestibular nuclei now there is another important connection from the vestibular nuclei which is there to the eyes which are known as vestibular ocular reflex now if there is a problem with the inner ear, that means say that if the person has a peripheral vestibular loss, what will happen is the input to the medullary vomiting uh, center will reduce because of which the person will have vomiting sensation or the person will have vomiting spells. Now, another, this one important connection where the input will reduce is to central nervous system because of which there is going to be a mismatch of the information between the three uh, sensory system because of which the person will have imbalance issues. Another important uh, structure that is vestibular ocular reflex when this reduces, the person will have uh, nystagmus and the person will have issues with the image stabilization. And when the, uh, the re input will reduce to your spinal cord, that is to the vestibular spinal reflex system, then the person will report of unilateral weakness, that is weakness on one side, and person will also report of falling sensation or swaying sensation towards one side. So there is one problem, but there will be multiple number of signs and symptoms which the person is going to report. Now, as a professional, what you need to understand? Now, as a professional, you need to understand certain signs or certain complaints of the person. Now, first complaint will be there that uh, the patient might report to you with a complaint of vertigo. Vertigo is nothing but it's a true spinning sensation, wherein the person is going to tell you that either the, um, the surrounding is moving around him or her, or either he or she is moving around the surrounding. So it's a true spinning sensation. And most of the time, most of the time, but not all the time, but most of the time, vertigo comes because of dysfunction in the inner ear. Now, the second problem which the person might tell you is a syncope. Syncope is nothing but the patient is walking and suddenly he faints, suddenly he falls down, loses his, uncon his consciousness and he becomes unconscious. Now, if the person reports of unconsciousness or a person reports of syncope, that means to say that now you have many doors which are open and one of the door which is opened is the cardiovascular system. So there could be a problem with the cardiovascular system of the person and because of which there is a blackout. Another problem which is there, it's disequilibrium, wherein the person will tell you that, no, I don't feel that the surrounding is moving rather than when I start to walk or when I stand, I feel that I'm swaying towards one side. I have a drunk feeling. I feel that I will fall down one towards one side. This is called as disequilibrium. Now, this kind of disequilibrium will be present only in the upright posture when they try to stand or when they try to walk. But when they are lying down, they will not feel any this one and this is most of the time this is because of either bilateral vestibular losses or either it is because of central nervous system damages now there are some red flags for the red signs which you have to understand when the patient is reporting to you or reporting to your clinics that is one is the dangerous decombination the dangerous decombination is nothing but apart from the vertigo if the person is reporting of diplopia, dysarthria, dysphonia, dysphagia, dysymmetria, dysthesia, or mental dullness, you have to be very alert now. Now, this will indicate that the person might have a central nervous system disorder 
or the person might have a problem in the neurological system rather than the peripheral vestibular system. Apart from the dangerous D combination, you also have headache, that is 3S, headache 3S, that is headache of sudden in origin, severe headache or the sustained headache are very important. And if the patient reports to you, you need to consult a neurologist and you need to send the person to a neurologist for further consultation. There are some characteristics of peripheral and central vestibular disorder, that is vertigo, which is coming uh, because of the peripheral uh, system or vertigo, which is coming because of the central uh, system. That is, uh, the peripheral uh, vertigo usually is sudden in nature, whereas central vertigo is insidious, insidious in nature. The clinical picture of peripheral vertigo is paroxysmal in nature, whereas central vertigo is continuous in nature. Peripheral vertigo, initially it is maximum, that is the intensity is very high in the beginning, later it is going to come down, whereas central vertigo, the vertigo is always mild in nature. The duration of the vertigo for the peripheral vertigo, it is in minutes to hours, that is few minutes to hours, whereas the central vertigo can continue for days or weeks together. The vertical nystagmus is usually absent in peripheral vertigo, whereas in central vertigo, the vertical nystagmus is usually very common. Now, tinnitus and hearing loss is very common in cases with peripheral vertigo, whereas central vertigo, it may or may not be present. Now, these are the causes for uh, vestibular disorder, and uh, this is an acronym which uh, 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 is put for uh, the, the causes for the various vestibular disorder. That is, if you want to remember, it is vitamin D, GO. And V stands for vascular, I stands for infective, T for traumatic and toxic, A for autoimmune, M for migraine and menius disease, I for idiopathic, inflammatory, N for neoplastic, D for degenerative, D for also developmental disorder, G for genetic causes, there could be a hereditary causes, and O for others which are not there in this list that includes in other causes. This is vitamin D go. Now this is uh, another cause of what I go, and uh, this is on the lighter side, not uh, uh, very this one serious, not on the lighter side, all the married men will understand that what is the cause of real what I go here. Okay, so now when you have uh, the patient in your clinic, you need to uh, get some tests done. And uh, the test involves various things. That is first set of tests includes uh, a lab test, which includes a complete uh, blood count. That is the count of WBC, RBC, esnophils, hemoglobin, lymphocytes, monocytes, etc. And then you also need to get the thyroid profile checked for the patients. Nutrient level, you have to get it checked. Glucose level, that is to rule out. Uh, whether the person is diabetic or not, and uh, the lipid profile, hypertension, hypotension, you need to check out, and then you need to check the uh, urine test, get the urine test done to rule out any kind of infection in the body. Not only the lab test, we need to do certain audiological tests, and these tests are pure tone audiometry, emittance, photoacoustic emissions, auditive brainstem responses, glycerol test, vestibular myogenic potentials. We have uh, certain behavioral evaluations, that is, uh, we have some subjective tests, which is there, and this includes Romberg test, Fukuda stepping test, finger to nose test, tandem gait test, and hints, which is nothing but head impulse, nystagmus, and test of skew. And uh, we have certain vestibular tests. We have many vestibular tests, out of which uh, the one which are commonly done across the clinics are electronystagmography, video nystagmography, dynamic posturography, video head impulse test, and subjective visual vertical test. Now, this is uh, something, uh, a very small table, what has to be done with a patient uh, when they report to you and uh, what you need to do here exactly. If the person reports with a dizziness symptom, there could be three types of dizziness symptom which they might report to you. It could be acute severe dizziness, it could be a recurrent positional dizziness, it could be a recurrent attack of dizziness. Now, if the patient uh, reports to you with acute severe dizziness, consistent, either it could be consistent with vestibular neuritis, or it may not be consistent with vestibular neuritis. If it is consistent with vestibular neuritis, first line of treatment is a medical management followed by vestibular rehabilitation program. And if it is not consistent with vestibular neuritis, then consider a stroke evaluation for the patient. Now, recurrent positional vertigo, wherein the person has uh, vertigo due to change in head position, that could be consistent with BPPV or may not be consistent with BPPV. If it is BPPV, then particle repositioning maneuver has to be done. If it is not consistent with BPPV, then consider evaluation for central structural lesion. That is, you have to check, you have to send the patient for a neurological evaluation. Now, recurrent attacks of dizziness that is coming in episode, either it could be consistent with menius or it may not be consistent with menius disease. 
If it is consistent with Meniere's disease, then again supportive measures and outpatient follow-up, that is medical line of management will be first given. And if it is not consistent with Meniere's disease, then consider transient ischemic attack evaluation in that particular patient. Thank you uh, for the time. And uh, now we will uh, move to uh, the uh, panel discussion. And uh, just one minute, we'll just move to the panel discussion. Okay, so we will start with the panel discussion on uh, what I go and uh, I have uh, framed several questions and uh, I have questions to uh, all my panelists and um, I would uh, put the questions here on the screen and accordingly my panelists uh, can answer the questions and after this uh, we will open uh, the panel uh, for uh, the other profes other professionals who are attending this meeting and they can ask the questions and uh, the panelists are going to answer. Now, uh, uh, this is uh, the first question uh, which I would like to ask to Dr. Neeraj. Dr. Neeraj, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Now, this is the first question to you, uh, Dr. Neeraj. As we know that uh, there are uh, patients who are reporting to our clinic and dizziness is a common symptom reported by many of our patients. Now, as an audiologist, what about patient reported dizziness is most concerning to you? What is that is most concerned? And what disorder do you mostly, most commonly see in your clinic? Uh, I'll answer the first question first. Uh, the, the most concerning to me as an audiologist, because I must understand that I'm not a medical professional and therefore I cannot deal with uh, medicines and uh, certain emergencies. So acute onset vertigo, that means if suddenly patient is telling me from last night continuously I'm dizzy and it's severe spinning sensation, I think that concerns me the most because uh, while on one hand it could be because of the ear that is vestibular neuritis or maybe labyrinthitis, the other side of it is uh, the dangerous one which is stroke and uh, in my opinion when I see a patient with acute dizziness, the first thing I want to rule out is if this patient is not a patient of stroke. And that's where the test that you talked about, the hints, the hints plus. So we, I generally like to use that test for, uh, for identifying whether it is a patient who is likely to fall in the stroke domain or it is a patient who is uh, more likely to have a vestibular issue. And if once I rule that out, then I still have to suggest the patient to get hospitalized so that the initial medication can be done even for vestibular neuritis. But this is a problem which I don't see that commonly. Uh, the problem that I see most commonly is a position. Dr. Neeraj, you are not audible. Dr. Neeraj, we cannot hear you. Uh, that, they, that they turned their head up and they started having dizziness. So these are the conditions which, uh, which I see most often. And this is generally a sign of BPV. Okay. So you have uh, uh, BPPV patients mainly in your clinic. And uh, do you have any other positional vertigo patients also, which you see in, um, uh, in your clinic apart from BPPV? Yes, uh, uh, these days, maybe more due to awareness, but these days I'm seeing uh, quite a few patients whom I find that they have orthostatic hypotension, which is when you measure blood pressure while the person is lying down or when the, and when the person is sitting, when the person is standing, you measure blood pressure in these three positions and there is a change of blood pressure by more than 10% between any two positions. That is called as orthostatic hypotension. So especially older people, uh, people in their late 70s or 80s or in their 90s, if they suddenly... Dr. 
डॉक्टर नीरज देर इज सम प्रॉब्लम विथ योर ऑडियो डॉक्टर नीरज कैन यू हियर एस डॉक्टर नीरज ही सीम्स टू हैव नेटवर्क इश्यूज डॉक्टर नीरज कैन यू हियर मी yeah in between we missed after orthostatic hypotension uh, when you started uh, then your yeah. connection lo lost right Can you please so, repeat that uh, once again yeah the orthostatic hypotension uh, is the problem when uh, when vp fluctuates between positions when the person is sitting up or when the person is standing up the B, the blood pressure changes so when a person say a old man sits up suddenly so at that time the person could have a spell of dizziness which could be lasting for few seconds that is what is orthostatic hypotension something similar complaint to a bppv okay so do you recommend that uh, the patients who are coming with a report of uh, a positional vertigo must undergo this uh, evaluations for hypertension or hypotension yes exactly especially during this covid situation uh, sometimes i get a referral where the person is talking to me over phone and uh, uh, when they want to come to see me directly before that itself i tell them if they have a positional complaint i tell them get your blood pressure measurements in all these three positions and they can inform me over phone itself if i see a, a difference of more than 10% there in the report i normally ask them to see a cardiologist get a table tilt test done and then come back to me okay thank you dr neeraj uh, my next question is to mr sarup Uh, Mr. Sarup, what are the specific signs and symptoms of these vestibular disorders? Can you explain in brief? And also, how a layman person will understand that he or she has a vestibular problem? Yes. Uh, hello. Yes, we can hear you, Sarup. Okay. So, uh, specific signs and symptoms uh, of vestibular disorders are very uh, like you can say different. when a patient is coming to us uh, with a different sign and symptoms first uh, many patients are telling about that it's a true spinning on rotating sensation that means asking the patient or uh, patient tells that, uh, your environment or your surrounding is rotating or you are self rotating sometimes some vegetative functions problems are there like vomiting and uh, nausea uh, some people they have oral fullness or blocking sensation kind of things uh, they have hard of hearing or hearing loss Uh, there are some uh, ringing and uh, roaring sound inside the ear that is called tinnitus and fluctuating of hearing loss um, most often people are saying uh, if you ask them uh, do you feel any kind of uh, hearing loss uh, sometimes it is very hoarse and sometimes it's good they are telling us yes, i am feeling some fluctuating of hearing loss and um, it's also some depends on the episodic attacks on the durations also sometimes it's from second to minute minute to uh, uh, you can say uh, days and day to uh, weeks also and some different vague symptoms are also there some people they are telling sir i am not feeling fresh uh, you know sometimes is uh, some something is reeling inside my head and uh, sometimes they are telling we are imbalanced uh, sometimes it's very uh, near to fall or fall uh, some people are saying it's a blurred vision when i'm uh, moving through my bike and uh, trying to look the uh, different sides right and left sides i am feeling something is uh, blurred and uh, sometimes it's very uh, sweating sensation are coming breathlessness uh, Uh, they are very panic very there is some anxiety and fear and uh, most of the people they are telling you know uh, sir uh, something is reeling inside my head i can't explain like how it is so these are some kind of signs and symptoms often we are getting from patients so in uh, different kinds of patient approaching for us before the assessment and uh, i can say as a layman person uh, uh, like we can ask the uh, surrounding rotating or self rotating blocking sensation any kind of sound inside the ear or about the hearing loss that i can say specifically for the vestibular disorders okay uh, uh, related to this only the next question is to you only mr swarup that is are there any differences based on the age that is related to the sign and symptoms do kids have the same trouble with dizziness as adults um yes uh, you know uh, actually if you will see uh, many patients um, uh, they are telling uh, i am uh, i'm not uh, my maintaining my balance properly so 
often uh, you will see uh, some children uh, although dizziness vertigo imbalance disorders are considered less common in children but they are often inexperienced in describing their problems so even if they have different kind of problem like as a professional we can say uh, benign paroxysmal vertigo or a vestibular migraine a motion sickness or some kind of head headache or hard of hearing they often experience with coughing sneezing or uh, problem when they are uh, doing some coughing and sneezing they have some kind of uh, imbalance or vertigo problem at the same time they have often uh, prone to head trauma due to during playing all these things so they have labyrinthine concussions or some kind of bppv or some viral infections as well so uh, even if uh, the problems are present inside the children and the children are facing day by day but uh, they have uh, very inexperience so they are not telling us the exact uh, uh, sentence what you want or exact signs and symptoms but if we'll make a good relations with rapo with them we can ask uh, in polite way or we can tell something to them then definitely they are uh, telling us the exact things what they are feeling and with increasing of the middle age uh, you will feel some kind of uh, vestibular neuritis labyrinthitis or minious disease um and also if uh, you will see as uh, dr nirus explained uh, some feeling faintness due to low blood pressure low sugar and some cardiovascular disorders orthostatic hypotension or migraine or some people they have also psychogenic also so these are some middle age uh, people you will see and when uh, with the advancing of age people are often associated with bppv benign paroxysmal positional vertigo then uh, uh, um this is डिफरेंट <laughs> बिहेवियर <laughs> so many of time the neurologist and pediatric neurologist they did some eeg and uh, they told that eeg is also normal but still is some kind of seizures disorder so you keep on uh, doing some kind of uh, medication so but uh, for me when the child that child was to me tried a different test like a vamp test c vamp i did and also i counsel the child for uh, bng Uh, even if the child is not cooperative at all but still i got some information that yeah some positional things are there when I, the child is sleeping at that time some kind of nystagmus is there so with uh, uh, doing different kind of maneuver in a play method the child is got cured thanks thanks to god uh, and but my mother is so happy that sir my child is now not crying uh, during sleeping conditions so for children i am not always uh, doing all this test instrumental test because the children are not operating but cvm compulsory i am doing for each and every children and for adults in clinic i have lot of equipments like uh, video nystagmography i have um, uh, vhit i have uh, then vam cvm and obm also i have all the audio vestibular test what you have explained in our presentation so i am dealing all this test i am doing one by one depend upon the patient's need and once i am doing all the audio vestibular profile test i am getting my reports done and uh, if it is a bppv and i can do the maneuvers then i am doing if it is something beyond my uh, practice limited my practice so i am sending doctors concerned doctors or neurologist orienting for the medications okay thank you sarup uh this question uh, uh, since uh, uh, mr vignesh is working in a medical setup uh, we don't get to see the patient emergency patient uh, at uh, speech and hearing institute or the clinics but he might be seeing many patients uh, with an emergency and uh, uh, my question to mr vignesh is that uh, if a patient experiences a sudden onset of spinning vertigo should the patient immediately go to the emergency department or is there an alternative way to take care that you would recommend i uh, yes sir am i audible yes 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 
uh, sir, a patient, if a patient comes with uh, uh, continuous persistent vertigo, so lasting for maybe at least an hour or more, so immediately you should take to an uh, emergency department. That is a very, very important because first thing that you have to rule out is the presence of infarction or a stroke so uh, within the because stroke needs immediate uh, it's like a heart attack it's a brain attack so you need to uh, act immediately take the patient to the uh, heart, um, to the emergency department they will recommend to take a ct scan immediately so usually when a ct scan is taken uh, within uh, 3 hours to or within the short duration they need to take it and uh, uh, if there is a thrombosis being identified uh, they will recommend for a, a thrombolysis a procedure called thrombolysis to remove the block or to prevent the further neural damage into the brain so that's the first thing that uh, an emergency uh, procedure is done also, there are other central causes which can uh, mimic like the same thing, like multiple sclerosis. They may have uh, uh, lesions in the brainstem, which can cause uh, uh, both motor symptoms and sensory symptoms, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, sudden spinning sensations. Especially in epilepsy, they may have um, uh, uh, intractable epilepsies or a very severe uh, continuous uh, epilepsy for more than uh, hours. Though all these patients should go. Uh, immediately to the uh, the emergency department, and also in peripheral causes, especially the infection, inflammations or infections to the vestibular nerve or the inner ear uh, needs to be taken because they this these things are considered as uh, autological new emergencies. So that has to be taken considered uh, taken also. So taken care also. So first procedure, what they do is when they, when they a general examination, after general examination, taking their heart rate and other all the measures, uh, a physician will recommend for a neurological examination. Uh, when a, neurolo a neurologist uh, uh, examination, and uh, if there is any neurological problem, that investigation will be carried out within a one day or two days. And... Uh, 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 if there is uh, nothing in their part and uh, neurologically the patient is fine and the third thing that they would refer it's for a yeah, uh, uh, ENT uh, opinion so and audiological test battery they will recommend for so when a patient comes to the neurological there are other alternate ways that they patients can come to the hospitals also they may first go to uh, a, a neurologist and then come back to the and come back to the ENT or they may start with the uh, neurology, they will end up with directly, uh, uh, here in our department, we have something called neurotology clinics, separately it is there dedicatedly for uh, uh, catering the needs of uh, patients with uh, uh, vertigo. So they will be referred, they are referred to the place from the other departments, they will be referred to the neurotology clinics. In the neurotology clinics, uh, uh, after a physical examination, careful examination of the patient, they will be uh, recommended for emergency audiometry. So emergency uh, uh, audiometry has to be done immediately or any basic uh, uh, testing like uh, uh, positional testing or initial neurological, uh, neurological examination if it shows that it is labyrinthitis or uh, unilateral vestibular pathologies or acute vestibular pathologies, they may uh, start on with uh, steroid therapy for the patients or uh, they may treat with the uh, steroid therapies and symptomatic treatment is done. And other, uh, 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 but we have to confirm whether this uh, uh, hearing loss and vertigo is associated or with the patient is having with the hearing loss or without hearing loss. That's the first discrimination that is being in the, as a procedure, as a part of the procedure. So after that, uh, whether the patient is uh, position, having positional vertigo or not positional vertigo, that is the second thing that they will differentiate it. If it is a patient with uh, um, um, positional vertigo. They may uh, they may to start with maneuvers, and they and uh, audiologist can treat with the maneuvers, and then uh, 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 improve improve them. If not, if it is associated with other neuro other uh, vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis, any acute vestibular pathologies, uh, then it has to be treated with uh, medications. So that is the routine procedure being carried out, sir. Here. Okay. So uh, it, the next question imagine, is. Uh, yeah, the next question is again to Mr. Vignes. Now, okay. if a patient comes to your clinic or comes to the hospital for testing, uh, how much time yeah. generally it uh, takes to do a vestibular testing and uh, which all types of tests are done and how much time the patient should uh, have or they should uh, uh, 
uh, uh, when they are coming for vestibular evaluation, how much time they should have in their hand so that the entire testing can be done. Yes, sir. If a patient is having persistent vertigo lasting for more than 48 hours and all, they will be admitted in the wards usually and they will be having a complete detailed evaluation in their wards. If it, they are coming through OPs, outpatient for patients, so when they uh, enter into the neurotology clinics, usually a uh, neurotological uh, examination will be carried out, which will be including uh, a behavioral tests of uh, uh, vestibular assessment. And uh, if there is uh, signs of any indications for BPPV, you treat with, uh, which may take around uh, um, uh, 30 minutes, a maximum of doing all the maneuvers and then uh, treat the patient. Uh, may required and before that they will at least rule out that these are not associated with uh, any hearing disorders any related uh, audiological um, uh, 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 pro auditory problems so a yes, screening may be done that may require a pure audiometry may take around 20 minutes or something so that is uh, uh, a routine assessment for patients with bpp if it in case of other vestibular disorders like uh, uh, neuritis labyrinthitis and all yeah, still a detailed evaluation may be required or even a central assessment, central vestibular pathologies are there, a deletion in the brainstem or cerebral lamp, which is causing uh, symptoms of vertigo, then we may have to um, uh, 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 completely assess the patient. So in such a case, an appointment will be given for these patients on a particular day where the complete evaluation may take around uh, two hours to three hours completely. All, all the, to include, uh, if it's a CP angle tumor, it may take around... Uh, Pyotin audiometry, speech audiometry, impedance audiometry, all these testing can be, uh, uh, would be uh, done, which may be around one and a half hours it will take, and uh, electronistagnography or video nystagnography can be done, which may have to take. So the total duration may be around uh, three hours and uh, complete uh, uh, two to three hours. It depends on the patient, sir. If it okay. is very minimal. So, but uh, minimal two to three hours is required. Yeah, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, before I go uh, ahead with uh, the set of questions which I have prepared for the panelists further, there is a question from uh, one of the participant and uh, uh, I would uh, uh, request uh, Dr. Neeraj to answer this because he is working in this area at present. So, uh, Dr. Neeraj, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Uh, Dr. Neeraj, there is a question from the participant saying that, uh, sir, does the food we eat associated to what I go in any way? Sodium rich or sodium low foods, for example? Uh, yes, it depends upon uh, what food you are talking about and the pathology. Uh, for example, if a person has got migraine, then uh, certain food items, and this differs across patients, it need not be the same for everybody. But if a patient has got migraine, then certain food items can trigger migraine. Uh, for example, in the Western countries, if they have a red wine, then it can trigger my. Dr. Neeraj, uh, I think your network has a problem. We can't hear you. Dr. Neeraj. And uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. In between, uh, I think there was some network issue. We could not hear anything. Yeah, I think it's raining very heavily outside here. And uh, I think uh, Wi-Fi is giving a trouble because of that. Uh, so, yeah. So, if menias disease, then uh, redu reduction of sodium intake does help. Uh, like that, there are quite a few things. The, some, uh, some disorders, like for example, in, again, in migraine cases, the intake of ca caffeine does affect so it depends upon which disorder, but yes, there is a relationship between food and uh, the vestibular uh, symptoms. And if a person does identify a correlation like that, try, avoid, uh, try avoiding that and see whether it helps. And if it does help, then definitely that food is problematic and should be avoided thereafter. Okay, thank you, Dr. Neeraj. And uh, there is one more question from the participant and uh, I request uh, Dr. Vinay to answer this. Dr. Vinay, are you there? Dr. Vinay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is, sir, is it possible for a person to have vertigo without any underlying causes? Um, you know, when we look at vertigo, there are uh, many different causes that can be put into, uh, you know, uh, after diagnosis, you can kind of try and uh, uh, put them into some kind of boxes. 
but there are of course uh, uh, many health conditions including vertigo where even after extensive investigation uh, people fail to find any uh, a specific cause so that doesn't mean there is no pathology that doesn't mean there is no problem but uh, uh, it may just be that uh, even after looking very hard uh, with the routine investigations you may still not end up finding a specific cause okay uh, thank you uh, my next question is to suresh sir suresh sir can you hear me sir yes yes uh, dr yes, sir uh, sir uh, imbalance is a significant concern for adults as we age why is this case and uh, do you have any guidance on when to seek out the balance therapy resources well yes uh, like anything else uh, in life uh, so balance and uh, maintaining posture is important at any age and it becomes more important as we grow older because everything that we've been doing so far up to that age is linked to mobility and you've been doing it without any assistance you've been walking around you've been getting up sitting down you've been cooking and mm-hmm. turning and picking up stuff uh, keeping it down so you're moving effortlessly Uh, from one aspect of your daily routine to another without any assistance so you would want to do that you want to continue to do that that's a concern of people especially elderly over the age of 70 they would want to be as independent as possible so in every language you see the people react that way if they see an elderly person is very quick on their toes they're walking around quickly they're doing their work so you tend to appreciate it you say in kannada estute agidare avaru nodu estu ee vayasallu heng idare so you know so they are all appreciated for that so for that reason uh, imbalance becomes a factor and is it imbalance particularly affects the elderly uh yeah that is difficult to say because as you grow older you are also not healthy most of your system is not keeping up with you so you have additional illnesses uh, now that is also wrong if i to say uh, because so everything that we know diabetes uh, uh anemia like you were saying cerebral vascular issues leading to stroke everything is happening quite pretty early in life from people on 30 onwards is experiencing it more and more so it is not specific to elderly anymore but earlier it was specific to elderly so there was more concern to keep them healthy keep them uh, medical condition free and treat their medical condition as early as possible and as well as possible that is one aspect you have to continue to do that advise them uh but apart from that is there any uh, issues with uh, aging yes some of the conditions uh, which all of you are talking about so far like pppv uh, manias there is higher incidence with aging so there is more chance that uh, people over the age of 60 gets these issues and they need to come to us and any health professionals and get treated so that is one more concern and uh, one more thing happens with aging is also your quickness and reflexes so balance is also a reflex we all know that what we call we are vestibular ocular reflex when you turn your eyes should move along with your head your eyes should focus on to things which is very important like when you are driving for example you need to focus and you need to be quick when some when somebody moves across faster you need to orient yourself quickly all this becomes a uh, little slower uh, we can't call it a lot um, difficult but there are issues but uh, we, the studies also show that uh, elderly have to depend more on visual uh, stimulus and proprioceptive stimulus to maintain balance and posture that is something you have to keep in mind uh balance is integration of all three as you explained very well during early presentation so your knees your uh, feet your muscles tells the brain how to coordinate and how to move around without falling down and uh, vision the eyes tells you how you are focused how you are oriented 
uh, that information has to be integrated with vestibular system. Uh, this processing a little slower as you grow older. So if you have already have a uh, vertigo inducing cause, so this recovery and compensation and reorienting yourself, getting back on your feet, may be a little more timing and you need much more help. You need assistance from professionals to get back on your feet you shouldn't ignore okay i had a vertigo i took medicine for a week now i'm all right you may not be all right because suddenly when you want to bed down bend down and pick up stuff you may fumble and in our uh, homes we have uh, thresholds on the doors so you have to step on it so if there's a low vision and all that you may trip falling of course obvious and everybody alarms and you're immediately uh, taken to a medical help but if you keep tripping, you may think that you have any issue, ankle issue, you're absent-minded and all that. It may be that you're not compensated enough for, from your vertigo issues. So you may need uh, to consult and come to us and uh, get specific um, suggestions and modification in your lifestyle and you go on some exercises to quicken your reflexes and compensation and go on with your life. So when to worry how to worry yes the symptoms itself so if you are constantly dizzy if you con when you turn if you are not comfortable you need to see a specialist and when you change your medication when you take your bp tablets and after two hours you're still dizzy then you need to see a consultant so your routine whatever advice has been given you should not ignore it that's pretty important and along with that, uh, every activity which involves uh, uh, two or three coordination, what we call. So when you're sitting and you bend forward and pick up something from the table. So when you're standing, you slightly turn to one side and do something. So this kind of activity triggers your uh, imbalance of posture maintenance. Yes, that's the time you definitely have to consult a uh, ENT or a neurologist or a, an audiologist too because in India we don't specifically uh, wait for a referral. We are okay to see patients and when we feel uh, they need medical help, we always refer them back. So even that approach seems to be working in some setups. So, so looking at the background where you work, you can approach uh, one medical facility or the other and it's a may Vertigo assessment and balance are still very clinical. So clinical skills vary among people to people, profession to profession. So you may not get same opinion from everywhere. That is often frustrating to people. So uh, I guess we can't avoid that yet. But uh, yes, approach people as long as you're not comfortable with one opinion uh, and get the help. Help is possible at any age and uh, improvement is possible in any age and from the patient's point of view don't be too alarmed don't think age is a factor age is a factor as well as activity is also a factor if age brings you down activity and having healthy eating habits brings you up so you would be quickened and you do well so doing a bit of yoga, stretching exercises keeps your muscle tensions uh, as it should be. And that helps you to recover from any vertigo incidences along with anything else that we teach. And taking care of your sleeping posture, not stressing on your cervical vertebrae helps you on that. So those tips, you have to take care of it uh, and manage and we all know that body has a great wisdom. So your body tells you. So, a, you know, we all know that elderly will not run as fast as we know. So they reduce their activity. They keep uh, smaller steps as they walk and they don't um, walk too fast. So there's already inherently the body knows how to manage and cope. Listen to that, but don't be overly concerned. Don't limit your activity too much just because you think you're elderly and you you felt a little dizzy a few times over a month or a two. So just don't reduce your activity over. Unless, but you listen to your body. Be wise. So obviously after your 60 or 70, you cannot run and catch a bus or catch a moving train. Uh, 
but some of the modern lifestyles is a challenge so when you notice that please consult and see whether additional help is possible like you're going on escalator going on a lift if that becomes uh, there are places where you need to move around in a low uh, vision so as i said because of uh, various other factors uh, elderly have to depend more on vision and proprioceptive uh, proprioceptive uh, senses that is four times as much as on vestibular inputs as you grow older so they need to feel in india uh, proprioceptive feedback may not be that an issue because most of us walk around with um, bare feet so there is enough uh, proprioceptive and the surface is hard and uh, helps us in that way but if you're walking around a carpeted surface when you're walking in a uh, in a Uh, difficult slippery then you have to be careful so there your uh, basic wisdom and uh, common sense prevails so that's what i need to add thank uh, you sir uh, the next question to you is uh, what other specialist might be involved in the diagnosis and management of patient with a suspected vestibular disorders okay so vestibular issues are again broad so all the causes uh, you have shown uh, that vitamin d go says that those causes are not unique to vertigo those causes are uh, can cause many other medical symptoms so so the one task for the patient would be knowing whether it is only vertigo only vestibular or it is something which is prevalent something else wrong in the body and that is leading to vertigo that's what i think mr agnesh was referring how important uh, for a stroke assessment but we have to remember some of the strokes early on are transient events so they're called transient ischemic isch- ischemic um, incidents so it's a fleeting symptom you are having imbalance and dizzy feeling a day and two and you're all right so you may not want to go and seek uh, uh, medical opinion so it's so that's why the most important person in the vestibular investigation still is your family physician or a general practitioner so if there's a system where you have your own family doctor and they know everything about you that is still best for a vertigo assessment so they know everything about you they have a detailed records of all your medical investigations so they know who to refer to at what point of time otherwise you may be too worried or you may not be worried at all so they should know how to take care of you and uh, send you to the right professionals so they becomes important in my opinion and the physician of course because your diabetes your blood pressure uh, those issues have to be regularly checked and if you're a lady your gynecologist is very important too because a lot of uh, vascular issues are linked and related so unless you treat the primary cause you may have repeated or uh, imbalance issues which can be easily taken care of your anemia is taken care of your eating habits are changed so your uh, imbalance issues are taken care of so if you are having a spinning rotational then it's very easy because then it's a ent neurologist and audiologist a team would more or less can take care of it because it's a bppv or not bppv now initially when it came on we were very happy that at least there's one clear cut disorders we can treat and uh, get over it the patient is happy or happy but now as all of you are discovering it some part bppv scan overlap with uh, transit ischemic event so you have to constantly watch so you need to keep a track on the patient you thought it's bppv but 6 months one year later you may have to revise your opinion that's why I, uh, there is importance of a family physician or a general practitioner to keep a track of what has happened and what has worked and what has not worked and as uh, uh, dr vinaya manchaya mentioned so many times we can investigate and we may not know the cause yet but sometime down the line it may becomes apparent so that's why one uh, primary uh, healthcare especially a physician should be involved and we all becomes expert referrals that we have our inputs to give to 
and uh, simple diseases to identify and treat like BPPV, vestibular neuritis. So we all have a role to play, identify. Our test batteries are clear cut in identifying this. So that can be immediately help a patient, uh, whether he's got a help or you should move on to. Whenever there is a doubt and a risk, so a neurologist can be called in and uh, uh, radiological investigation can be requested. So, and in terms of rehabilitation, yes. Uh, so rehabilitation exercises, uh, more and more audiologists I see getting involved. So in a two decades, there's a lot of change and that's a very good sign. And uh, that has to uh, happen a lot because rehabilitation, when you take it upon, it's a challenge because in speech and swallowing other, uh, the patient is tuned to come back on a follow-up. But audiology patients, neither the clinician, neither the patient is tuned to come for a follow-up. So you need 10 to 15 days of exercise, one month, two months of regimen. So how do you ensure it? So we have challenges there. So if we can address that, so vestibular rehabilitation is beautiful. So you could do it alone, You, but it's better done in a team along with physiotherapist and occupational uh, specialist. So each one has a contribution. They can bring the patient out of feeling of dizziness and into the uh, independent uh, living lifestyle. So it's possible. So then you need phys uh, physical therapist, you would need occupational uh, specialist to, to manage your rehabilitation and medical management is your basically your ENTs and neurologists and physicians, they take care of it. So these are the two aspects, assessment and management. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, my next question is uh, to Dr. Vinay Manchia. Dr. Vinay, are you there? Uh, yes. Hi, Sajid. Yes. Uh, uh, the next question to my next question to you is that do you feel that lifestyle management can help individuals with vestibular disorders? Uh, yes, I think uh, lifestyle management is an important part of uh, managing vestibular disorders. Uh, I mean, not just vestibular disorders, I would say for any chronic health condition. Uh, when I say chronic uh, condition that occurs for you know three months or six months or more, uh, and, and in such conditions, um, uh, generally uh, we look for an immediate medical therapy, which is uh, very important. And in addition to that, uh, it is also equally important to think about uh, a behavioral management uh, or behavioral modification, which does include lifestyle management. Uh, for example, let's say somebody has the diabetes, and uh, you know they may be advised to take some medications. But just taking medication alone doesn't uh, help them in the long run. Uh, they have to make certain changes to their, uh, to their lifestyle. And um, uh, when we think about this lifestyle, usually uh, it kind of belongs to either adding a certain new things to your life, like making diet changes, uh, incorporating some exercises, or uh, leaving out certain things that you're you currently doing. And uh, specific to a vestibular condition, there are um, various types of lifestyle managements that, uh, that could be advised. Uh, for example, uh, often people with vestibular disorders have uh, a difficulty traveling. You know, they have a fear of traveling. So developing some kind of travel strategies, uh, managing motion sickness. Um, uh, if they're at home or, or walking, then using certain types of footwear. Uh, in the Western uh, countries, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of discussion around the idea of home safety, uh, whereas in India it is not so much because of uh, people living together, but I think it's equally important also in India to think about home safety um, you, so that you avoid f falling down and uh, breaking and you know uh, having injuries. Uh, thinking about uh, attending certain types of events and uh, even more importantly, even learning how to manage uh, stress and other comorbid uh, comorbidity that, that, that comes with in a vestibular condition. So, um, Often the lifestyle management has been less emphasized in vestibular uh, management, uh, but I think it should be equally or more important uh, uh, than the medical therapy itself. So um, uh, if somebody has been experiencing these kind of conditions and if they're looking for like a magic bullet that will cure or immediately go away, uh, then they should may be disappointed thinking that a lot of these vestibular conditions will not just go away. Some of them with certain types of treatment, they will go away immediately. Whereas for most of the vestibular condition, 
I think uh, uh, long-term lifestyle management is what will uh, give them uh, more fruitful results. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. Uh, my next question to you is, uh, uh, is to Dr. Vinay only that uh, psychologically, how the vestibular disorders affect an individuals uh, with vestibular disorder? And do you think help from a psychologist would be required for all the individuals with vestibular disorders? Uh, okay, again, uh, there are two parts to it. I'll start with the first part. Um, uh, I think let me take a step back and say that uh, you know, people with vestibular disorders may have uh, consequences in different domains. So first, uh, they may have some physical consequences. Uh, second, they may have some emotional consequences. They may have some cognitive consequences as well as some social consequences. Uh, for example, if you think about physical consequences, you know, or difficulty walking, difficulty doing certain types of activities, uh, emotional consequences, which is you know, fear, anxiety, uh, but if that continues for a long term, maybe some kind of depression, um, uh, cognitive consequences, which are difficulty in, atten um, in attention concentration, and maybe finally social consequences, which are uh, because of all of these things, you know, doesn't want to attend some group events or social events. So uh, with uh, summing this up, I think there is clearly um, uh, vestibular problems affecting psychology. And I think it's important to look at uh, what is the immediate response and what is maybe the long-term response. Um, I think often immediate response to vestibular problems are a fear, anxiety, and panic. Like if you're suddenly not able to walk, if you suddenly start noticing imbalance, then you would have a, um, a lot of fear and anxiety thinking, you know, you're not able to do things, something terribly wrong with you, and maybe you can never get better and, and those kinds of feeling. And over a period of time, uh, if that doesn't, uh, get cured or, or reduced, or if you don't learn the proper techniques, that will uh, result in uh, many other psychological issues, including depression, uh, fatigue that will make you really tired. And uh, because of all of these people become more irritable, that means they're, uh, they feel more grumpy and uh, irritated all of this, uh, you know, most of the time. So uh, clearly, I think uh, anything that happens to our body, including vestibular problem, have an effect on psychology. Uh, and uh, that needs to be dealt with. Uh, now I move on to the second part. Uh, do you think uh, you know everybody needs psychological assessment and intervention? Uh, I would not say everybody needs a psychological assessment or intervention. Uh, I think uh, the immediate responses like fear, anxiety, and panic, uh, those kinds of things will go away if they were uh, intervened immediately and if they were given appropriate types of rehabilitation. Uh, you know, once you start getting uh, once you start becoming better with your balance, once you start able to walk properly, like how you did before, uh, you start to lose this fear, anxiety, and so on. But if it becomes a long-term condition, then um, that will have a big impact on your self-confidence. That will have a big impact on, uh, you know, maybe you'll start developing some kind of depression and, and so on. So these issues uh, would require uh, psychological management uh, and uh, a psychological consideration would be needed. And most of the health professions, whether it is a physician or an audiologist, when they do a vestibular assessment, uh, uh, in addition to kind of looking at your balance, they would also look at how you're affected in your life generally, which does involve kind of screening to some psychological issues. And if, uh, if they do find that uh, such, a, uh, such an assessment or care is needed, it is important to make a referral. But again, uh, within India, we don't have this, we don't need a referral system to see a specialist. So if you really think that you've been really bothered by some conditions and uh, that is affecting you as a person, your psychology, then you could of course uh, see a psychologist and uh, get some help. So a short answer to that, not everybody need, but a lot of people with chronic uh, vestibular condition would need psychological uh, interventions. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vinay. Uh, there is uh, one more question from uh, one of the participant, if you could answer this, how sure. caffeine and alcohol uh, affects the vestibular system? Is there any uh, relation between caffeine consumption and alcohol consumption uh, uh, with vestibular issues? So I know that uh, both caffeine and alcohol has been associated uh, uh, quite a lot with tinnitus. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, some of the vestibular condition, you know, people with vestibular condition also have tinnitus and uh, uh, intake of caffeine and alcohol uh, seem to make this ringing or buzzing sound in the ear worse. 
but I'm not sure uh, how it affects vestibular condition. Maybe other panelists could, uh, you know, uh, talk about this, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure on, on that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinay. Uh, if uh, anyone else could answer this question, uh, how the alcohol is going to affect the vestibular system? May I? Yes, yes, please, Dr. Neeraj. Yeah, as I briefly mentioned earlier, there was a question related to food, the relationship between food intake and, uh, and vestibular uh, system and vestibular issues. Uh, and as I said, yes, there is a relationship. And alcohol and caffeine are two things which are... Uh, which are often linked to it. There is enough of published literature. And uh, if you talk to really clinically experienced people, they do tell you that uh, uh, especially alcohol intake can definitely trigger a migraine attack. Uh, as, I, I, as I mentioned before, within about 15 to 30 minutes of intake of red, wi red wine, there will be an, a migraine attack. And migraine can be a vestibular migraine as well. So if there is a vestibular migraine, within about 15 to 30 minutes of an intake of red wine, which definitely is alcohol, uh, the migraine could trigger. And uh, all other kinds of alcohol can do the same. Uh, likewise, with the caffeine, uh, some vestibular uh, migraine people can also have this issue with caffeine. Uh, I normally tell people with Meniere's disease to reduce their caffeine intake. And my patients are very happy just with this and salt modification with, with those two. So, uh, so definitely alcohol and caffeine, in my opinion, uh, can trigger vestibular uh, symptoms. And uh, people with such symptoms, if they find a relationship, it is, uh, it's a problem which, which is occurring often, you can easily identify what is a common uh, thing between the two, means what do I do? And after that, the problem comes. So when you can just pay a little attention, you can find out. Most of my patients can tell me that actually. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Neeraj. My next question is to Dr. Kauslindra Kumar. Dr. Kausal, you are working in a medical setup. Uh, now, I, as I understand that any patient uh, who will have a TIGO and when they're coming to your hospital, they might not report to the speech and hearing department first, they might go to the general physicians or uh, an ENT doctor or a neurologist first. So can you please tell how important is multidisciplinary approach in rehabilitating these individuals with vestibular disorders? Yes, Sujit. Can you hear me, Sujit? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes. So as we all are aware that in medical setup, in under one umbrella, you have all the medical professions. So when you have all the medical profession together, so our diagnosis, we can do it quicker any diagnosis getting the result is much quicker. So with this, if you go ahead with that, most of the time I get the referral from ENT, neurologist, medicine department. So these are the few of the department who are very closely associated with us and we work as an interdisciplinary team. So in this team, as you have already pointed earlier that the vestibular pathology patient is just like a football. So what happened, rather than one person checking, if we all professional take the opinion, then we can able to diagnose it. So that's the, we say it's a quick decision. So if we are in a team that is interdisciplinary or we can say the team approach, so we can take a quick decision and we can decide is a patient, what is the causes? It is a peripheral or central. Also, the patient can save the time as well as the cost of the whatever the patient is going to spend it. If the patient goes doctor after doctors, most of the time you will see many of the patient is a doctor after doctor, they will go and then they will come to us also. So in this, if you have interdisciplinary approach, we do the assessment, many of the patient directly they come because of, we have published many of the article in the local newspapers and all. So when they come us, we find anything, what we do, we work as a team. We will consult if it is a kind of view, if we find anything central pathology, we will discuss with the neurologist and then we will be sending it. If we find peripheral pathologies, then we will be mostly sending to the ENTs. And if we find some of the pathology which we can treat it like BPPV and even the, some patient who has been treated with the 
neuritis and all and uh, still they have some kind of that uh, still we can go ahead with that so when you do as a team all together all the professional you will see that we see as a what type of patient as a whole we don't see as a individual like when we are in a team the ear is seen by the ent then brain is seen by the neurologist then muscle weakness and all those stuffs are seen by the uh, physiotherapist we work with the physiotherapy also closely then the medicine that is a physician they will see that you have pointed out many of the tests which is important for that so we do go ahead with that and then we do the assessment of the bp sugar then the if they have the any kind of infection then the many of the blood tests will be done and then we take the conclusion okay what is the diagnosis can it be treated with the kind of medical or can it be treated with the kind of uh, rehabilitation among that also we decide if it is a pure vestibular we do give the rehabilitation if it is a balancing issues then we do send the patient to the physiotherapy and then we go ahead with that one more important thing us because we are interdisciplinary we work together what happened during when we give the therapy what you will see that there are a chances that some of the times you have started the therapy and along with the therapy that is vestibular rehabilitation patient is taking medication so when we are giving the therapy and take a patient is taking the medication the medication has to be reduced so that time again we need the help of the medical people as on the progress we will be showing it the medical fraternity has to reduce the doses or the terminate the doses and the patient has to bring back to the normal life using the vestibular rehabilitation so we need as a combined holistic approach and to find out a diagnosis and a better treatment interdisciplinary will be helping the patient much more and their quality of life will improve yes sujit okay, uh, thank you uh, dr kaushal uh, my next question is uh, to dr neeraj uh, that is nowadays many hearing impaired children are implanted uh, with the cochlear implant do you think that uh, because uh, the implant is inserted inside the cochlea there might be issues with the vestibular system so they might have balance issues do you think that this uh, balance issues are really worrisome and uh, the parents really need to worry about the same dr neeraj dr neeraj can you hear me i think there is some network issues we can go to the next uh, question and next panelist uh, by the time dr neeraj joins back um uh this question is uh, to mr sarup sarup can you hear me sarup can you hear me sarup are you there sir am i audible yeah neeraj uh, your internet has some issues i believe yeah please uh, go ahead yeah i'm really sorry about that i mean there is nothing in my hand that i can do uh, yeah uh, coming back to the question itself uh, yes i have uh, in last 4 or 5 years i have been also working with uh, children uh, who have been implanted and have uh, for several of my research work i have done uh, uh, i have done assessment their vestibular assessment and i have seen that uh, some of them can uh, some of them can have balance issues and uh, uh, recently we had done a project in which uh, we had done a before cochlear implantation balance assessment and after cochlear implantation balance assessment and we found that uh, after cochlear implantation the balance issues were there however we also found that there were not permanent balance issues there were uh, uh, transient issues uh, only in a few cases it was permanent which needed to be taken care of uh, so it is not worrisome for uh, everybody but uh, in a few people yes we do need to worry and uh, 
uh, I would say those people are maybe about 10, 15% who after cochlear implantation also need to uh, go for vestibular rehabilitation. Okay. So that means to say that uh, you are saying that uh, uh, the patient will not have chronic violence issues that can be managed easily. Yes, exactly that. Uh, I mean, not everybody, as I said, about 10 to 15% of them may have a chronic violence issue and uh, that needs to be treated using the vestibular rehabilitation. Uh, others may feel transient vertigo, but that may also be because of blood loss and other things during the surgery because the surgery is an extensive, extensive one and uh, depending upon the surgeon's skills, obviously, it may take a little longer time. Uh, uh, and therefore, because of the medical condition, also initial vertigo may be there. That has been confirmed by many studies in adults. And uh, the other thing is, once people start moving and walking, the central system starts to compensate. And that also takes care of balance issues in some but there are others in whom it doesn't happen automatically and they need to undergo vestibular rehabilitation to ensure that their balance returns back to normal. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeraj. Uh, my next question again is to Dr. Neeraj only. What would you want the general public to know about vestibular disorder, its assessment and management? Uh, I think... Uh, one thing that I want people to understand is uh, we are referring to it as a vestibular disorder, but it really need not always be vestibular. It can be due to uh, the issues with vision and also the issues with uh, the muscles and uh, joints of the body. So, uh, and there are many different professionals who can help people with vestibular disorders. Audiologist is one among them. And uh, I definitely feel that, uh, that, they, that uh, people with balance disorders should not try on their own. So, certain times I have seen that uh, like uh, somebody has seen a BBPV treatment being done and then they try to do it themselves. Once I have guided somebody using a telemode and then later on I, uh, I got to know that that person was trying to do it on another relative of his uh, who had the same similar kind of problem and failed. So you shouldn't try to tackle it on your own. Seek a, uh, seek a, either a medical advice or an audiologist's opinion and, um, and try to manage that. Uh, also, I want to tell people is more, for most of the vestibular issues, you don't have to panic. So panic is something that should be avoided. However, if, the, if there is, a, especially if there is a spinning sensation, that you, the person is feeling that I am rotating around in circles or the environment around, is, around me is rotating. And if this is lasting for a considerable length of time, say more than an hour, as Vignesh mentioned before. So if it's lasting for a long time, I think that is the only medical emergency that I would look at. Other than that, I think people should not just panic. They, they should remain calm, but at the same time, seek medical uh, or audiological help as soon as possible. And uh, for most of the disorders, management is possible. So people should not think, oh my God, I got this problem. And then uh, now that is the end of my life and I can do nothing. That's not true. And for most of it, treatment is easy and possible. And I feel BPPV is something, the positional vertigo, which I talked about, when you change your position and you start feeling uh, moving, uh, spinning like sensation. And that is something which occurs most often. And that is something which is easily treatable. So that's my uh, message to everybody, not to panic, seek appropriate help. And uh, uh, majority of the times you will be treated. Thank you, Dr. Neeraj. My next uh, question is to Dr. Kausal. Uh, Dr. Kausal, what is your overall key take-home message for providers working with patients uh, with vestibular disorders? Hello, Sujit. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So, the person who is working with the vestibular disorders, so first of all, we should not underestimate the general impact uh, of vestibular dysfunction for any patient who comes. We should not underestimate of their health 
health as well as the functionings. We should listen them first because they many of the patient will come with the chronic long standing vertigo. So first listen them. They will have lot of reports. They will have lot of medications they have taken it. So do listen there and don't underestimate anything. First listen everything. Just take a record of everything. Then not to jump into the conclusion without detailed assessment. Do the proper detailed assessment. Take the case history detail. There only you get the idea about that. Then after the case history, do the screening behavioral test and then. decide what is the test you need to go ahead with the patient based on the central or peripheral so do proper assessment and then make a conclusion what can be the diagnosis for the patient once you do the proper assessment then when you are going with that that is the interdisciplinary what i have talked to you earlier the same thing dealing patient with vestibular disorder in a interdisciplinary approach will provide good quality of assessment as well as the management so maybe the patient required the medical management or maybe the patient required the vestibular rehabilitation so when we work together as a interdisciplinary then we can decide it as i rightly said it if it is a true vestibular disorder we as a audiologist we can give the vestibular rehabilitation but if it is just a balancing they have the kind of muscle weakness or maybe because of the some other weakness or the paralysis they have the balancing issue do we can refer to the physiotherapist for the exercises and all and then they can go ahead with that then once we come to the we know that okay this patient has to go for the vestibular rehabilitations we have a set of exercises so customize those vestibular rehabilitation to be given properly to each patient so it should not be the patient will come yeah we will do it so customize the therapy plan whatever the vestibular rehabilitation so today what we have given do keep the record of that then next session what we are going to give so plan properly then monitor those uh, progress that is very important say that so we have a checklist you can use the dhi or whatever the quality of life and then do so the patient what are the progresses and those progress patient you can see the evident most of the patient will be able to make out the differences and when you have the dhi or the quality of life assessment for vestibular disorders do do the assessment on them and try to show them the improvement so that patient will have the kind of that okay i need to go for more and more and then get treated as quick as possible so for that follow up is very important for us so what we should do it we should be always in touch with the patient and do follow up and then try to get the patient and then we should be giving 6 to 8 weeks if it is a long standing if it is a bppv 1 to 2 session we should be able to one session not even two sessions in some patient around five patient you may have to go for two session or anything but if it is a long standing then customize your protocol and then you can go ahead with the rehabilitation but always whenever you are advising the patient to go for the home rehabilitation you have demonstrated it and then patient has to go and do in home tell the patient don't do alone you should have a stand by especially when you do the standing when you do the exercises rehabilitation exercises with the sitting there is absolutely no problem but if you are going to do with the standing exercises the patient may feel sometime and violence or they might fall it so they should have always a stand by who can hold whenever they need it and then we should go ahead with that okay thank you uh, dr kausal uh sarup is there sarup can you hear me are you there i think i think he yes, is in yes, i'm here yeah sarup uh, i think uh, you are uh, one of the person who has uh, uh, set up a vestibular clinic uh, if you could briefly tell that you know what are the basic requirements to uh, set up a vestibular clinic uh the audiologist if you want to open one independent clinic so uh, first of all uh, setting up a vertigo clinic is a state of uh, art right hello yes so, yes i can hear you yeah we should understand the basic fundamentals of vertigo clinic first so no need to go for the instrument purchase then i will learn it's not like that 
first go for the audiological evaluation which is mandatory that if you have audiometry speech audiometry or the vera cytology and test after that if you have money and also your doctors refer in patient to you continuously and you can go to doctor can visit them you can tell them sir i am a bit confident on what you are doing and if you make a good rapport with them some neurologist generalist patient you विनय कैन यू हियर मी सुजित Okay uh what is the role of an audiologist in assessment and rehabilitation of individuals uh, with the vestibular disorders and as i understand that uh, american speech and hearing association uh, has given license uh, to the audiologist to do the vestibular evaluation so if you could uh, highlight the role of audiologist in assessment and rehabilitation okay so uh, you know audiologists by profession are uh, specialist in hearing and balance Uh, most people know that audiologists deal with hearing but very few people uh, kind of associate audiologists with the uh, vestibular or balance issues and uh, this is not just for people with uh, these conditions i would say this is also true for those who uh, who are in the medical professions you know many general physicians do not know that audiologists provide uh, uh, vestibular assessment and management um i would say that in vestibular field there are, we need help from multiple professionals depending on what the condition is and what the consequences are this could be from a, a general physician otolaryngologist neurologist um uh, maybe some physiotherapist and also audiologist but i think of all of these audiologists have a central role to play uh, and um, generally they have they have a maybe role in three different elements you know the first uh the assessment uh, that are done by audiologists may help identify what is the cause you know where the problem might be in the vestibular system or the central nervous system uh, so that is one and the second i think audiologists are very important in uh, understanding the functional Im- impact of vestibular problems like what kinds of uh, day to day activities uh, that are affected and uh, how the vestibular conditions may have affected your life or psychology and third uh, i think audiologists can play a key role in uh, uh, developing vestibular rehabilitation plan and uh, implementing uh, them as well as studying if those plan and uh, strategies are working for you okay so uh, but this uh, role from audiologists vary uh, from country to country uh, because audiology is quite a diverse profession and uh, in some countries uh, audiology uh, education has a doctoral degree like in the us in most of the world audiologists have either bachelor degree or a masters degree but in some parts of the world um, 
audiologists are technicians with uh, with very basic training on uh, hearing assessment and uh, hearing aid uh, uh, fitting. Uh, whereas, uh, fortunately, in India, uh, audiology is uh, quite a well-established profession. Of course, there are access issues. We could have more people uh, being in more places, uh, making it easy for people to access in our services. Uh, but I think uh, I'm glad to say that audiology is a, a quite a well-defined uh, profession uh, within India, and uh, they have an important role to play in vestibular assessment and uh, management. Um, and um, it doesn't matter what the condition, I think it, they can still play a role, either in assessment or in uh, functional management or in um, uh, developing treatment strategies. And I think if you have to consult one person, I mean, of, among all of the people, if you have to consult one person, I think for people, the immediate one would be a general physician. Uh, but I think if you know that your problem is mainly vestibular or balance, it is not your eyesight or it, it is not your muscle, then I would say maybe you should cut short and uh, visit audiologists directly. And uh, they can do the assessment and then maybe make refer to other health professions. But what typically happens is most uh, people do not know what, uh, what is an audiologist and what their roles are. And they tend to kind of navigate through different uh, health professions. And some people end up in audiology and some people never end up in audiology. Uh, but anyway, to sum this up, I would say that audiologists have a very important role in the assessment and management of uh, vestibular disorders. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinay, uh, for uh, this. And uh, I also thank uh, all my panelists uh, for answering the questions. Uh, but uh, wait, uh, the, uh, this one is not yet over. We are done with vestibular, but uh, we have to start with tinnitus. And uh, I request uh, Dr. Vinay uh, to please present, uh, the, uh, uh, present his presentation on uh, tinnitus. And uh, I request everyone to stay back for his presentation. Dr. Vinay, over to you. Uh, Sujit, I need to screen share. Will you be able to? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll just do that. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Vinay, you can uh, share your screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so, uh, well, first, uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, this talk is really not aimed at health professions or, or audiologists. So I developed this talk uh, solely focusing on those who may be experiencing uh, you know, these kinds of symptoms. Uh, and uh, I do volunteer to um, you know, help out in uh, many tinnitus support groups. Uh, for example, I live here in uh, Houston, Texas, and uh, I run the Houston tinnitus support group. And uh, quite often people have uh, several questions. So instead of making this talk uh, uh, more like an academic lecture, I thought uh, you know, I would take this opportunity to answer some of the common questions that people with uh, uh, this ringing sensation might have. So uh, in the next 15 minutes or so, I will hope to answer about 20 questions. But uh, depending on, uh, uh, on how it goes, uh, if we have time, I'm happy to take any additional questions uh, you might have. Okay, so the first obvious question is what is tinnitus? Uh, this uh, word tinnitus comes from Latin, uh, uh, mean tenere, uh, that uh, really refers to uh, uh, what is called as to ring. And uh, tinnitus generally means when you hear something in the ear or in your head, but there is no external sound. Now, there is no sound coming from outside, but somehow you're able to hear something uh, within your head. Um, and also um, people ask, uh, you know, do they all need to hear the same kind of sound? I would say that no two people with uh, this ringing sensation or, or buzzing sensation are similar. They vary quite a lot in terms of the type of sound, uh, how often they hear, a number of sounds they hear. Uh, for example, uh, you know, people may hear ringing, buzzing, clicking, uh, uh, you know, this kinds of sound. Some people have a sudden onset, like one day they wake up and suddenly they start hearing this ringing. Other people may have a, a gradual onset. That means they start noticing some. Uh, sound a very low volume and over a period of time it gets uh, more worse and worse. And again, people can hear a single sound or a multiple sound. It can be a continuous sound or it can uh, like, you know, come and go like a pulse tone. Um, so um, generally this could be very different from the experience from one person is very different to other. And also where they hear the sound, some people notice clearly that, you know, I'm able to hear sound in right ear. Some people uh, may think they have a sound in their head. Some people may not distinguish where the sound is uh, coming from, but as long as this sound is within their head or body, not from outside, you know, that is uh, what is the sensation of uh, tinnitus. And 
in the beginning when people notice this sound um, they have a lot of fear and anxiety mainly because they may associate this as a serious problem or a serious disease thinking you know i may have uh, some tumor in my head or you know or, or something really serious so but uh, fortunately tinnitus is not a disease it's it could be a symptom of an auditory pathology uh, but it it is not a, a disease and um, uh, there are uh, lots of uh, uh, different experiments there, there is one that i'm uh, uh, you know uh, i want to share which is relevant to here is um, uh, many decades ago uh, there was a, a, a researcher who uh, you know made uh, uh, people sit in a uh, completely sound proof booth that means they can hear no sound of the outside so it is probably the the silent place on earth so and they put the people who did not have any sensation of ringing or buzzing in that booth and uh, they let them sit there for 5 minutes and ask them after when you were sitting in the booth were you able to hear something and the interesting thing was uh, uh, nearly 70 or 80% of the people in the sound proof booth who did not have any sensation of ringing or buzzing at that time when when it was really really quiet were able to report that uh, when they were in that very very quiet place they were able to uh, find some sensation in their hearing or in their head so what that suggests is that uh, if you are in a very quiet place even those who are not bothered by the sound they may experience some kind of sensation uh, in the ear uh, sometimes it may be uh, some kind of sounds that are generated within our body or uh, sometimes it could just be a phantom sound that uh, 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 we hear um and uh, we can classify tinnitus into broadly two types uh, subjective and objective a uh, subjective tinnitus meaning Uh, only those who experience this ringing or buzzing uh, hear the sound okay so if somebody is next to me they will not hear only i can hear my tinnitus and uh, whereas an objective tinnitus means uh, if i am noticing sound maybe somebody next to me here can also hear the sound but this objective tinnitus is very very rare in my 15 nearly 15 years of my career i probably seen this like uh, one time uh, most commonly tinnitus refers to subjective sensation of uh, ringing in the ear and the objective if people does have objective it is not always too bad sometimes it is just some uh, normal physiological uh, uh, noise but it could also be some abnormal pathological process uh, in the body that could be uh, related to muscle activity or uh, you know, abnormal blood flow and so on uh, so uh, most people who have ringing or are buzzing or sensation of sound they are usually having subjective tinnitus and also people are often ask uh, what are the causes uh, there are many causes potential causes for uh, the, this uh, sensation in the ear um, uh, i've kind of listed some of them here but uh, what i would say is noise exposure uh, uh, it is a, uh, whether it's a recreational noise exposure like listening to loud music or a occupational exposure like working in a, uh, a high level of noise uh, that is probably the most common a cause for uh, tinnitus but there are many other causes including uh, natural aging when people get older they lose uh, you know hearing and that may uh, result in tinnitus using certain types of drugs uh, um, um, can cause uh, tinnitus there are different types of uh, hearing pathologies auditory pathologies um, uh, certain types of medical conditions you know neck and jaw problems head injuries so th- there is not a single cause there are lots of causes for possible causes for tinnitus uh, but most common is the noise exposure so if you don't want to uh, if you want to avoid getting you know uh, a tinnitus then i would say that uh, taking care of your hearing and uh, uh, not exposing yourself to uh, loud uh, sounds for a longer duration of time will will help okay and how common is it um, uh, you know the the population studies from around the globe uh, generally shows that uh, about 10 to 15% of the general population notice tinnitus that means anywhere between 8 to 10 uh, uh, one in 8 to 10 people and uh, while anybody uh, from children adolescents and adults could experience tinnitus i would say that um, uh, tinnitus is more common in older adults uh, you know 40 or 50 years age uh, and above uh, it is more common and it is also more common in males than females uh, that is primarily because uh, traditionally uh, men uh, mainly worked in a uh, noisy settings and as a result of noise exposure they uh, you know developed tinnitus so uh, i would say that is true uh, even now uh, and uh, are some people more likely to de- 
to develop tinnitus? Uh, I would say again, yes. Uh, again, some of these risk factors that I discussed earlier, like exposing to noise, uh, or being older, having uh, certain types of hearing conditions or medical conditions, uh, they're all uh, a pre, uh, what I would say as risk factors. Uh, there are some uh, internal risk factors as well, maybe like uh, genetic uh, uh, predisposition and other things. Uh, but we are, uh, I think, starting to find more and more um, uh, now. And uh, uh, if I have to give only a few, I would say that these are some people that, uh, you know, those who work in uh, noisy conditions, those who are older, certain types of hearing and medical conditions are those who are more likely to develop tinnitus. Okay. Uh, although, you know, there is a large percentage of general population who experience this, not everybody is equally affected by this. You know, if you see these statistics from the US, uh, I'm sorry, I do not have any uh, data from the India. I'm sure there is there are some studies, but I was not able to find. Uh, if you take 100 people with tinnitus, usually for about 30%, uh, they it is not a problem at all. They may say, I hear sound, but I never uh, have any problem. Uh, for uh, about 60% of the population, it can be a small or moderate problem. Uh, but only about 7% of those who experience tinnitus, it could be a big problem. Uh, that means it is affecting their sleep. Uh, it is resulting in some anxiety and depression. Uh, so those are, the those are the people who would uh, really need some clinical interventions. Um, and also within US, nearly 50% of those people who have this ringing uh, say that they have discussed this with their physicians. I do not know what uh, is the percentage of this uh, within in an Indian context. It could be more or it could be less. Uh, I'm guessing that it could probably be less. Okay, and why some people are more bothered by than others? Um, well, it depends on several factors, uh, type of pathology. Uh, uh, but I think the most important factors are uh, your emotional react reaction as well as coping strategies. Uh, like when you have the sensation of sound, how you associate yourself to that sound, uh, as well as the coping strategies that you may have. For example, some people may have a passive or negative coping strategies. Like when they have tinnitus, they don't go out, they just stay home, they stop doing all of the other activities. Whereas others may have more positive or active coping strategies. Like uh, they try to do some physical activities, like exercising, and they try to uh, uh, you know add some sound to their background. Uh, so all of these together, you know, maybe type of pathology they have, but more importantly, emotional reaction and coping strategies uh, is what determines whether people are bothered by the condition or not bothered by the condition. But one thing really important to note is uh, this is a very, very, uh, uh, very highly heterogeneous condition. That means no two people with this condition are the same, both in terms of what they hear as well as how they react to this. Dr. Vinay, can you hear me, Dr. Vinay? Think, uh, people with genetic often report uh, uh, trouble concentrating, uh, so people have uh, trouble sleeping. Uh, if this continues, people may have developed uh, anxiety, depression. Uh, some people may have social isolation. That means they may not go to some social events because they have this ringing sound in the ear. So, um, you know, tinnitus can affect uh, both your psychological as well as social. Uh, it could also have physical consequences. For example, if you do not sleep very well because of your ringing, the next day you might be really tired and uh, grumpy. So you, you could have, you know, physical, psychological as well as social consequences as a result of uh, tinnitus. Um, in terms of testing, there are different things that can uh, that needs to be done when people uh, with tinnitus are being investigated. Uh, specifically for tinnitus, there are subjective and objective ways. Uh, when I say objective, uh, you know, audiologists may present series of sounds with different uh, loudness and also different pitch, and try to match uh, what type of pitch uh, and uh, intensity of uh, ringing you are, are buzzing your hearing. But those have not been very useful. Uh, I would say subjective way of uh, studying the tinnitus. For example, uh, how tinnitus may have affected your life using questionnaires uh, has been most commonly used and probably most helpful. In addition to that, uh, it is also equally important to assist hearing and hearing pathologists to understand uh, is there any hearing loss uh, associated and are there any specific hearing conditions. In addition to that, it was also important to understand the additional comorbidities such as an anxiety, depression, sleeping problems, and so on. So a tinnitus assessment usually looks into these three domains. One, looking into tinnitus itself, 
second looking into hearing third looking into any any additional comorbid comorbidities and often people with tinnitus uh, uh, want to get rid of their sound but uh, very unfortunately there is no cure uh, for tinnitus um and if there is no cure uh, people also look for some kind of uh, uh, you know relief a quick, quick relief which could be from uh, medication or dietary supplements uh, very unfortunately there is no scientific evidence that any medication or uh, dietary supplement uh, work uh, there are lots of these kinds of products being sold on the internet uh, be very careful of this because some of these can have very harmful effects um and well there is no cure there are no medication so uh, do we need to just leave with this condition uh, not at all although sometimes the advice you might get from some medical professionals might be uh, there is nothing for tinnitus you just need to live with, live with it i would not say that is true uh, it really depends on how problematic this condition is for you uh, if you are just uh, you know mildly annoyed then i think you will probably learn strategies to manage it but if it is starting to affect your uh, attention concentration sleeping and all the other things then i think seeking uh, help from audiologists or psychologists uh, uh, may be of help so uh, like whether you seek help or not really depends on how badly you are affected from this condition uh, well if there are no cure are there any uh, evidence based treatments or uh, uh, management strategies i would say that uh, there are three uh, although there is no cure uh, very fortunately there are uh, you know uh, fairly good uh, uh, treatment and uh, management strategies that people could use and i can classify them into three uh, main domains in the first sound therapies uh, for example just enriching some environmental sound putting a light a background music or a, or a noise or if somebody has a hearing loss maybe wearing a hearing aid will have a big impact on their tinnitus perception often uh, having some sound therapies uh, will have a positive impact on the tinnitus nowadays people with tinnitus also download some apps uh, with uh, with light light, uh, light music like you know music of the uh, ocean and things like that and they listen to them and uh, it gives them some relief uh, the second but probably the most evidence base is behavioral therapies uh, which uh, facilitate habituation uh, like you know there is no cure but there are strategies and well you have this condition but how how to learn to live this condition without it being affecting you so there are many types of therapies including the cognitive behavior therapy which can help uh, users uh, or people suffering from this condition learn strategies to uh, manage the condition in addition to that i think uh, there is also a lot of move towards general wellness Uh, uh people with tinnitus who are really bothered seem to report that uh, it is more concerning and more bothersome uh, when they when they're not exercising when they're really tired when they're stressed uh, you know at the end of the day so uh, general wellness like uh, meditation yoga uh, doing the kinds of things that you like these general wellness will also benefit you uh, in reducing the distress associated with uh, tinnitus uh, and when to seek professional help uh, and i would say there are three things to consider when to seek professional help the first one is uh, when people start noticing this ringing in the beginning they just want some general examination to know there is nothing wrong with my ear there is nothing wrong with my head so i think it's fine to seek help at that time when you start noticing the ringing just to kind of get a general examination from your physician and uh, and an audiologist second uh, there are certain types of uh, tinnitus uh, like if you only have it in one ear or if you are noticing a pulse tone uh, like beep 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 you know this way those could be associated with some uh, medical conditions so if those are the types of uh, tinnitus you have then you should seek a uh, medical help uh, just to get diagnosed uh, to ensure that you don't have any serious medical conditions third but most important is if it is starting to affect your life uh, if it start to affect your uh, sleep concentration uh, at work uh, uh, and if you are uh, having a lot of anxiety or depression uh these kinds of things then those are really a clear need for seeking uh, professional help and often people when they have these symptoms they tend to uh, meet with their general physicians or, or a family doctor as the first point of uh, contact and uh, depending on who you see there is a lot of variability uh, in terms of knowledge about tinnitus among medical professionals and depending on who you see sometimes people may offer uh, some kind of screening for medical conditions Uh, some doctors may offer some brief information uh, some doctors may also make a referral but uh, um, i think one uh, piece of advice here is that uh, 
Uh, we also have seen a lot of bad practice in the sense uh, uh, doctors not making a referral when uh, patients are reporting this condition, uh, telling them to get on with their condition. It's not, a, it's not serious like cancer, so you just need to get on with their condition. I would say that is not true. If it is really bothering you, there are people who can help and you should be able to uh, get a referral and consult the right type of uh, health professions. And uh, what can audiologists or psychologists do uh, uh, if uh, patients with tinnitus are referred? Well, uh, an audiologist or a psychologist would uh, uh, first uh, maybe do a detailed assessment of those three different domains, like you know, hearing assessment, assessment of the tinnitus and its consequences, as well as comorbidities. So that is the first step. And for most people with tinnitus, just some informational counseling, you know, giving them some confidence saying, this is, a not, this is not a serious disease. Uh, you have this sound, but you're not bothered by it. So you get used to this. So you don't need to be worried about this. I think that is fine for most people. And uh, that with a clearance of medical condition. So if they hear that they don't have any tumor in their brain, then they're kind of relieved and the, the tinnitus doesn't become worse. But for some people, uh, the tinnitus will get worse. They will start to uh, uh, notice that it is affecting their life. In such cases, uh, audiologists uh, tend to offer sound therapies. Like if they have a hearing loss, they may offer hearing aids. Uh, but if, they, if the users don't want a hearing aid or if they don't have a hearing loss, then they are offered with some kinds of uh, uh, environmental sound enrichment uh, techniques. In addition to that, some people may need behavioral modification uh, techniques like uh, cognitive behavior therapy. So uh, these can be offered by either an audiologist or a psychologist, depending on where you live and uh, what are the expertise of these uh, professions. Okay, and the last uh, uh, question here is, uh, where can I find reliable information? Uh, and I think nowadays um, uh, it is common for most people, uh, including us, to kind of lean to the internet as soon as we have something. Uh, uh, some recent research, uh, including some from our own lab, has shown that uh, there is a lot of misinformation about uh, tinnitus on the internet, especially in social media. So if you're getting some WhatsApp messages about tinnitus, uh, be sure to check uh, its reliability because quite often it could be, it could be wrong. So I would say consulting health professionals uh, could give you reliable information. Uh, some government agencies could have good information, but I have not seen any good uh, government agencies within India providing this. I would say uh, maybe some patient associations like uh, American Tenetist Association or British Tenetist Association, in their website, they have listed uh, a series of questions and answers. In addition to that, uh, uh, some really good uh, information for patients. So I think those could be... Uh, more reliable information uh, for those who are experiencing these kinds of uh, symptoms. So with that note, uh, I conclude my talk and thank you for uh, this opportunity and thank, thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, if time permits, I'll be happy to take any uh, questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinay, for such a wonderful uh, presentation on tinnitus. And I think uh, you have answered uh, uh, all the questions which one may ask uh, from beginning, uh, how the tinnitus is generated, or what is the cure, or there is no cure, or there is sound therapy. Thank you once again for such a wonderful presentation. And uh, again, I thank uh, all my panelists uh, for uh, patiently listening to the questions and answering all the questions which were uh, given to them. I thank once again to everyone. Over to Minakshi, ma'am. Minakshi, ma'am, you are there? Yeah. I Thank you, Dr. Sajid. Thank you so much for moderating this session so well. And I would like to thank all the eminent panelists here. Uh, you really made the topic seem, this is, I know this is a very difficult topic and it, you know, it, we have tried to make it so simple that probably a lot of people would get help. All these sessions will be posted in, on the YouTube for later viewership also. So I'm sure many, many who have joined us today and many more would get help from all these sessions, all these uh, information and interactions. Over to you, Naika, sir. Evening, you. Evening, you to all. On behalf of the Executive Committee of ISHA, I thank all the experts in the panel today for their thoughtful insight on a topic that is gaining interest. It is heartening to see the audiologist being recognized in the field of diagnosis and management of balance disorders and tinnitus. Today's discussion has cheered the audiologist today to take an active role in coming days. I thank the moderator for the day, Dr. Sujit, for a well-balancing today's discussion. 
our panelists, Dr. Vinay Manchaya, Dr. Meera, Professor Suresh, Dr. Kausalendra, Mr. Vignesh, and Mr. Swaroop for sharing their knowledge and time for the today's drive on balance related issues. Thank you all and take care. Thank you once again, everyone. I know for Dr. Vinay, it was very early, but still, about his time, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, before we log off, I would like to share another information that what we have for tomorrow. Uh, a very exciting session. Just stay tuned for a minute. So, uh, sorry, I think. My slide got missed. Tomorrow we are going to be talking about uh, autism, various aspects, and we have a very, very eminent uh, panelist with a wide experience. So please join us tomorrow uh, for that session as well. And thank you once again. Good night to all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sir.